Good evening, <laughs> and welcome to the Glasscock School of Continuing Studies. I'm Dr. Mark Kulstead, and I'm a professor emeritus at Rice and the academic director of the Glasscock School's graduate liberal studies program. Glasscock School and the liberal studies program are jointly sponsoring, organizing, presenting this free event. It's my role and also my honor and privilege to introduce tonight's speaker at this free public event, uh, Dr. Robert J. Bruce, excuse me, Dr. Robert Bruce Jr. is the new dean of the Glasscock School of Continuing Studies here at Rice University. He's here and will be speaking to us in a moment. Although Dean Robert Bruce came to us from the University of North Carolina, his, uh, he has deep roots in Texas. He received his BA in English from the University of Texas at Austin and his master's and PhD in that same field from Texas A&M University. He has wide interests, including ones in 19th and 20th century American literature, naturally, including Mark Twain, realism, World War II, American humor, that's important, and film. With respect to the subject of tonight's lecture, Mark Twain, not only has Dean Bruce taught courses on Twain, but Twain served as one of the pillars of his doctoral dissertation. A few words about that are completely relevant to tonight's talk. The focus of Dean Bruce's uh, PhD research was specific periods of cultural, social, and political turmoil in the US and distinctive works of humor that emerged in association with those periods. The three key literary works were Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, after the Civil War, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, during the Great Depression, and Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, during the 60s. The title of the dissertation is notable, even in the slightly modified form I will use here, emphasizing dark humor. Here it comes. That's not funny. That's sick. <laughs> A bittersweet taste of American dark humor. Ask me afterwards if you want the full story on that title. <laughs> in case it isn't evident yet, let me emphasize that tonight's talk fits very well with the wide-ranging spirit of our graduate liberal studies degree programs. It features an important literary figure in a pivotal historical context connected to the ongoing political life of the nation. That involves three academic disciplines, literature, history, and political science, brought together in a seriously interdisciplinary way. The fact that humor is centrally involved also only adds to the breadth and humanity of the talk. I've chosen a way to emphasize this point as a final piece of my introduction. We all know about the Hamilton craze, a national phenomenon melding history, political life, and Broadway, with that latter involving, that last involving, broadly speaking, literature and the arts. The interplay among these areas in Hamilton is similar to that of the broad ranging interplay of tonight's talk, and also to the underlying spirit of graduate liberal studies as it exists here at Rice University. To put the point another way, the musical allows a person to see things with a broader vision, with new eyes. We hope that something of the same thing happens for our students as they engage in the wide-ranging, multidisciplinary education of our Master of Liberal Studies program. And by the way, let me take just a moment. We have 
the general public here, but this is part of our summer lecture series that is uh, sometimes for the general public as well, but always for our uh, community of graduate liberal studies. Those who are in the program as students, faculty, or alumni, would you please raise your hand just for a moment? Uh, good, so you're it's sort of in the 40, 60, 50, 50 range, but uh, that gives you a, a little bit of a sense of what's going on here. Uh, town and gown, in a way, an uh, academic program and then general public. Uh, and there's an indirect link between Hamilton and Twain, our subject for this evening. As most of you know, uh, behind the Hamilton on Broadway was the book Hamilton by Ron Chernow. Uh, Chernow has recently released another massive biography, again, as many of you uh, know, on Grant from the Civil War era so important in connection with Twain. And it turns out that Twain plays a central and moving part in the tragic last years of Grant's life, as becomes clear in the final pages of this new book, Grant. So we have Hamilton, Grant, the Civil War, and Mark Twain. <laughs> May that provide additional context for tonight's talk, entitled, Mark Twain, God's Fool. Let's welcome Dean Robert Bruce. Well, let me make sure I'm on here. Can everyone hear? All right. Well, that was quite the introduction. I, I sort of want to go and sit back down and listen to Mark continue. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it really is a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, as, as Mark was saying, um, this program, as well as other programs associated with the Glasscock School, uh, really are an incredible outreach for, I guess, rice to the community. Uh, but then what Rice receives in return, that sort of town-gown relationship that you were talking about, what Rice receives in return with really an audience that is very well educated, uh, very well interested in pursuing new educational opportunities, uh, and it just adds to the scholarship of this fine university. So uh, I am uh, I'm very proud and pleased to be here. I want to thank uh, Mark for the invitation. Rebecca Sanchez, where are you, Rebecca? Rebecca, back there, thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone for coming. The rain has held off 50%. As I understand, that happens every day in Houston. Uh, so I, I've been here for, uh, for nine months, and really I felt uh, very warmly embraced by the community, so I, I really do appreciate that. Uh, when, I, when I started talking with Mark and Re Rebecca about this, evening and really trying to figure out what is the best approach for this. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to do was, was take advantage of the opportunity that I had to do a shameless plug. <laughs> so uh, Assistant Dean Kathy Maris, Kathy raised your hand there, who is involved and runs our personal enrichment programs, our community engagement programs. On September 5th, you see, and that's actually from 3 to 7 p.m., and I know you can't read through all the bullets here, uh, but we're running through in several, there may be some faculty members in the audience here are going to participate, giving you a taste, a fall preview of what's happening. Um, and just in case you can't read uh, what it says there, the Midweek Medley, Lucy's Legacy, an Anthropologist's Guide to Human Origins, there's Studio Art, uh, After the Flood, we're doing a series on Harvey uh, with several faculty members uh, from around the, uh, the campus, publishing your story, songwriting, it, it goes on and on. Uh, but I did want to point that out and, uh, again, point Kathy out uh, for setting up just an incredible fall. Mark already mentioned this, but I'll plug it again, so another shameless plug 
for the Masters of Liberal Studies information session on September the 6th. Uh, we hope you will join us. And it looks like there are a lot of people who are already uh, involved in the program, and I'm sure they will, they will be there as well. So about the, the title um, of this talk, and actually the images here, uh, Mark Twain, God's Fool is the title of a book, for one. It's actually uh, an homage to my dissertation chair, Hamlin Hill, who was a Houstonian uh, and also a great Twain uh, scholar at Texas A&M University. And he, he wrote a book called Mark Twain, God's Fool that was really talking about the, the latter part of Twain's life, uh, 1900 to 1910, which was really a, a, a pretty dark part of his life. Uh, filled with family tragedy, uh, business dysfunction, if you will, uh, and overall depression. Uh, and some of his writings during that time really were, were, were quite dark. Um, the other is, uh, up here is Thomas Hart Benton, and that's a lithograph. And the lithograph is actually from uh, the mural that is in the House of Representatives lounge in the Missouri State Capitol. Has anyone seen this? All right, we have a couple of people who have seen it, A Social History of Missouri. There is also an association with Benton uh, and Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Benton remarked that he read it once a year, uh, and he illustrated an entire edition of Huckleberry Finn um, after, after Twain's death. We also have Mark Twain, The Signature, and I think most people have heard some about uh, Samuel Langhorne Clemens changing to Mark Twain and adopting a new pen name. There, there are disputing stories about this. Uh, some say that it was based on a bar tab in California. That's a true story. Um, others claim that uh, it was the name of another writer who was a well-known river pilot, Isaiah Sellers, uh, down in New Orleans. Twain liked the name, thought Sellers was dead, took it for himself, Sellers was actually alive, uh, it caused a little bit of a problem. Uh, that's one of the theories as well. Uh, the one that you've probably heard, and I think you've probably heard it because I think it's the one that's accurate, uh, is that it comes from his time uh, on the river uh, when people would walk out with their lines and they would throw it in the water and they would mark six feet, mark one, and then they would mark 12 feet, two fathoms, Mark Twain, so it was safe for a steamboat to pass. Uh, that name really caught on right about the time he started becoming popular uh, with some of his writings when he was out in California, uh, and that's really the reason that, that I use it there. And then the title as well, from a letter to William Dean Howells, Ah, uh, well, I am a great and sublime fool, but I, then I am God's fool, and all his works must be contemplated with respect. If you were looking at some of the quotes as they were coming across uh, earlier before we started, uh, I think it was a magical quote site. Uh, the best site is actually twainquotes.com. All the quotes that you will find there are verified. They're in a database, so you can go in and you can search by keyword. Uh, so you can enter Congress or President or Irony or Family or Mississippi, and there will be a string of quotes uh, that uh, all are verified, and it will tell you what publication they came from uh, in the year. And I, I do find that a fascinating part of Twain. Uh, certainly he was a prolific writer, uh, but when you start drilling down into some of the individual quotes and the power that they have, um, I, I think it becomes all the more fascinating. So our approach today, we'll go over humor and satire, we'll talk a little bit, very briefly, about Southwestern humor, Sam Clemens and Mark Twain, uh, the Gilded Age, which is a period in the late 19th century that Twain actually coined that term. Uh, it's also the title of one of his, one of his publications. Uh, then a little bit in contemporary political satire, and the, the question about the golden age of satire, it's really trying to bring it back, I think, to today. Uh, when I looked at this, and I was telling Rebecca, 
as I was thinking about it last night, I have far too much information. This should be a semester-long course. So this is speed dating with Mark Twain. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try not to rush uh, too much, but you're going to see some obvious gaps. Uh, so we're not going to talk about Ben Franklin and poor Richards, even though th there are some obvious connections and influence with Twain and those types of writings. Um, I'll mention Thomas Nast and uh, uh, Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall, but not as much as I would really like to with editorial cartoons uh, and the political scene that was happening at that time. Um, it's a pity, but we simply um, don't have that much time. But we uh, do need to talk a little bit about humor. And when you're talking about humor, I love to use this quote. Uh, a person who carries a cat by the tail learns something that he or she can learn in no other way. Uh, that quote actually, you can use it in all sorts of situations. I, I, I do want to point out that there are several pictures of Twain with cats because he absolutely adored them. Uh, and so they were all over his houses. Uh, so even the, the idea that uh, he's carrying a cat by the tail, um, there is more to it than that. So we're talking about humor. Let's do a little bit of a, an acknowledgement, a caution, a, a level set, if, if you will. So humor, I think we all know this, has the possibility, perhaps even it's the intention, uh, to offend. That is not my intention this evening. Uh, please, please know that. Um, but as, as George Carlin said, it, it is sometimes the comedian's role to see the line and purposefully cross it. I do think that's what humorists do. And when you wade into that territory, it does bring up certain subjects that make people uncomfortable. The humorist is doing that for a very specific reason. But we, as an audience, because of what we're bringing to this situation and our past experiences, we're all going to react differently. It's one of the intricacies of humor that I think make it so fascinating. But remember, my intent is not to offend. When we jump forward and we're talking about current politics, uh, this is a nonpartisan talk. Uh, so you, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I will let the political satire uh, speak for itself in that situation. So in the comedy of entropy, the scholar Patrick O'Neill suggests that scholarly, scholarly analysis of humor smacks all too much of academic humorlessness. And we need to restructure our approach. Walter Blair and Hamlin Hill, I mentioned Dr. Hill earlier, also recognize a hazard in their preface, preface uh, to their influential work, America's Humor. Quote, most authorities agree that laughter is a highly subjective response. So writers who are foolhardy enough to discuss the humor which does or doesn't produce it are an endangered species. Usually they are kicked around for allegedly proving that they have no humor whatsoever. It is customary to complain that they are unamusing nitpickers. So when you're studying humor and you're talking about it, I think there is a danger uh, that renders it perhaps unfunny, but then you have to think, is really the study of humor the intent to laugh? And I would say it's not. Uh, you have E.B. White, who has a very, how many of you have seen this quote before? Okay, several people. Uh, humor can be dissected if a frog can but the thing dies in the process and the enters are discouraging to any but the pure scientific mind. You're going to see this uh, in a lot of humor studies. Almost all the articles that are written about humor have some sort of E.B. White uh, nod there. But there's a little bit more to this. And that is, there is often a rather fine line between laughing and crying. And if a humorous piece of writing brings a person to the point where his emotional responses are untrustworthy untrust is because humor, like poetry, has an extra content. It plays close to the big hot fire, which is truth, and sometimes the reader feels the heat. I th do think that's where satire comes into play. Satire and truth are connected, or they try to be. And so the satirist is really poking at institutions, at hierarchies, at vice and folly to try and expose truth. So I think E.B. White's quote 
is very appropriate here. When you're talking more about humor theory, uh, you can go back and you can think about philosophers who have discussed this. Aristophanes, the father of comedy, Plato, Kant, Aristotle, uh, many have theorized about humor and its, its approaches. The Bible, laughter in the Old Testament is quite a dangerous thing. So take the kids who make fun of the prophet Elisha. From 2 Kings, verse 23, this is the New International Version. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy. They said, get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. That's really what it says. <laughs> Uh, and there are works written about humor in the Bible, but I, I can tell you that for the most part, it's no laughing matter. Um, there are theories uh, around superiority theory, for example, which is easy enough to understand. Um, I make fun of you, I make a joke about you, I'm superior to you. Those were really in the 18th century, fell out a little bit in the 19th century, although there are people who still discuss this. They sometimes call it sick humor, the humor of pain. Uh, and so I, I do think superiority theory or the superiority approach is still around somewhat. Uh, then you have, some call it uh, a catharsis or a relief theory, where it's almost if so you're so nervous, you're so uptight, you're so anxious uh, that laughter is a release. Uh, and that makes some sense as well. The most accepted theory, and, and take this with a little bit of a grain of salt because there's a lot of debate about this still, but the most accepted uh, theory really is the incongruity theory, that you're expecting one thing, you receive another. And you re the humorist will use all sorts of tools and approaches to set that up. Uh, but that is, in general, the, uh, the accepted theory of humor these days. We could head down a rabbit hole and talk about all the different types of humor. We could talk about irony and dramatic and situational and verbal. Um, but I think let's focus on satire. So for the purpose of this evening, let's agree that satire is an approach that uses humor to point out folly, to expose and discredit hypocrisy and vice, to force the reader or viewer to critique human condition. That's an important one. As such, satire often targets authority figures and the institutions they represent. Satire in and of itself is a, is a, it's a genre or, or a style. Uh, if you're going to use wit, exaggeration, caricature, parody, uh, those are tools for the satirist to use. Uh, but satire itself is a genre. So Rob, get to Samuel Langhorne Clements. All right. Visible from Earth every 75 to 76 years, Halley's Comet is the only naked eye comet that might appear twice in a human lifetime. Samuel Langhorne Clemens was born in 1835 when Halley's Comet was close to its perihelion or its closest point to the sun. Twain had several comments about birth and death, summed up beautifully uh, in this quote right here. I don't need to read that for you. So American literature, it was in the midst of a fairly uh, rapid change um, when Samuel Langhorne Clemens was born, and this is really in the 30s, 1830s, on from there. Uh, writers such as James Fenimore Cooper and Charles Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe, uh, they were still really dominating the scene, but there was a new player, if you will, in the literary landscape. A new genre was rising as tall tales began to make their way into literature. And the tall tales, put quite simply, positioned really the country versus the city. You had the, the large braggart, uh, larger than life, uh, who would come from the country who was supposedly ignorant. And then you would have the sophisticated city dweller, the carpetbagger, uh, who would come in, who had all the knowledge. And you can imagine what would happen in Southwestern humor and who would win 
uh, between the, con the conflict between the two. Uh, it was the peasant. Uh, it was the big country uh, man in this case, certainly in the, in the 1830s. And it was called Southwestern Humor. As the scholar Angel Price wrote, the heyday of Southwestern humor culminates in the period between the 1830s and the beginning of the Civil War. And the Southwest that we are referring to in this case, it's Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri. It is not Texas, it is not Oklahoma. The old Southwest Conference is gone. Uh, <laughs> And the, the style that developed originates from politics, oral histories. It's really a rough region that is out to prove itself. So humorists like Augustus Beat, Longstreet, George Washington Harris, and Davy Crockett, among others, were the forerunners of Mark Twain. They created a place in literature where the vernacular, the dialect, began entering into uh, the writings and sentences and regional caricatures with overblown stereotypes. Augustus Longstreet wrote a book, uh, the most famous was probably Georgia Scenes, uh, and I don't believe he's very well known now, except that he became president of Emory, I think the University of Mississippi, uh, and was also a, uh, an admirer of Twain. So we're fast forwarding here, in 1840, uh, the Clemens family moves to Hannibal. It's roughly 150 miles north of St. Louis. And Clemens, he only lived there 13 years, uh, but I, I certainly think that it shaped uh, his writings. And if you go up to something like Tom Sawyer, for, for example, which I think is the best autobiographical example of Twain, uh, you can see the origins in, in Hannibal. During this time, newspapers, they were proliferating across the country, and they were doing this because of literacy. Uh, people were learning to read, um, and the newspapers started including uh, little sketches. Uh, think of them as small stories, and they were very small, um, and they were satire, uh, and they were drawing upon the Sutton Lovin' Goods, the Augustus Longstreets, uh, and including these sketches within the newspapers. In 1852, at the age of 16, Sam Clemens publishes The Dandy Frightening the Squatter in the Boston Carpet Bag. So he's 16 years old. And I'm, I'm not going to uh, put it up on the screen, but I will read just a little bit. A tall, brawny woodsman stood leaning against a tree which stood upon the bank of the river, gazing at some approaching object, which our readers would easily have discovered to be a steamboat. Many passengers on this boat, both male and female, among them was a spruce young dandy with a killing mustache who seemed bent on making an impression upon the hearts of the young ladies on board. And to do this, he thought he must perform some heroic deed. He observed a squatter friend over on the bank, the woodsman. He imagined this to be a fine opportunity to bring himself into notice. So stepping into the cabin, he said, ladies, if you wish to enjoy a good laugh, step out of the guards. I intend to frighten that gentleman into fits. And he goes up to the woodsman, found you at last, have I? You are the very man I've been looking for for these three weeks. Say your prayers. The squatter calmly surveyed him a moment and then drawing back a step, planted his huge fist directly between the eyes of his astonished antagonist. And it goes on from there and the ladies unanimously voted the knife and pistols to the victor. Two things to point out about this. One, incredible that Clemens, at age 16, is writing this. The other is, think about the style. We were talking about the vernacular and the use of dialect. Uh, it's barely in the story at all. Instead, what you have is a very formal tone. The narrator uh, uses sophisticated, if you will, language. Uh, the woodsman speaks a couple of times and uses the vernacular. But for the most part, the story is told uh, by the sophisticated narrator. The other, of course, is that um, the country peasant, the woodsman, gets the best of the sophisticated, uh, what was it, the spruce dandy. Um, and so that, that, uh, that is a theme that continues. Over the next few years, Twain continued to write sketches and letters for newspapers and journals. 
They were largely humorous observations, exaggerated stories, satirical co commentary, and he traveled up and down the Mississippi until the Civil War broke out. Uh, and according to the scholar John Gerber, Clemens was involved in the Civil War. It was very brief. He went home to Hannibal and joined some of his old friends, the Confederate sympath sympathizers who called themselves the Marion Rangers. Hannibal was controlled by the Union, thus their activities had to be covert. Twain said he retired from the military and the Confederacy because he was exhausted from retreating. I was a soldier two weeks once in the beginning of the war and was hunted like a rat the whole time. Now that's an innocent enough comment. Later on, in 1906, Twain had this to say about war. Eighteen sixty five, of course the Civil War ends. Twain is in San Francisco at this time and he publishes Jim Smiley and his Jumping Frog, which has about fifty different titles now, uh, because the story was published in so many uh sketches and collections, um, and Twain himself changed the title uh, many times. It's at this point that he really jumps into national prominence and the story, first published in a New York newspaper in November 1865, it was quickly reprinted around the country. This is actually from uh, a London publication uh, a couple years later in 1867. The, the importance of the celebrated jumping frog uh, is that it was written in something called the frame narrative. And what Twain did, remember in the earlier story, The Dandy Frightening the, Squ Frightening the Squatter, uh, where it was a sophisticated narration pretty much throughout. In the celebrated Jumping Frog, you have the frame narrative where at the very beginning, and let's say it's just a few sentences, you have the sophisticated narrator who comes in and introduces the story. Then the story is taken over, and it is taken over completely in the vernacular uh, by the country woodsman, the peasant, uh, and the country woodsman or peasant tells the entirety of the story until perhaps the last couple of sentences at the end. The sophisticated narrator comes back in, frames the story, and it's set. Now, the story itself, and some of you probably uh, remember it, uh, it's the same sort of approach where you have a gambler who's trying to trick someone and the gambler ends up being tricked himself, uh, betting on a frog and they use lead shot and that sort of thing to weigh down the frog. But the importance of the story itself really is that frame narrative approach uh, that Twain used. That's going to come back into play uh, when we talk a little bit about uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The other important item I would say about the, the celebrated jumping frog is it introduced as well a deadpan narration. And so the sophisticated narrator uh, the country narrator uh, had a dead pan approach. If you've ever seen Hal Holbrook, and you're going to see him when I show a clip a little later, there is that kind of dead pan Twain delivery, and Twain did this when he would lecture on stage, but he also utilized it in his works. This comes into play again in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. So Huckleberry Finn, the only narrator is Huck Finn. The frame narrative is dropped. That was the first time that had been done in American literature where the vernacular had been used to tell the entire story. It's also notable that Huck Finn does a deadpan narration the entire time. He never laughs. The entirety of the novel. And when people talk about Huckleberry Finn as a humorous novel uh, with a lot of laughter, I, I question that. One, because of the topic that we're talking about. Uh, the other is when you start paying attention to the narration uh, and the character himself, Huck Finn. We're skipping all over publications here. 1867, uh, The Innocents Abroad or The New Pilgrim's Progress. Th this is a travel book, uh, a collection of newspaper articles that Twain had already published. And the, the book was, was brought together, and it's a narrative of, of Twain's voyage through Europe, Egypt, and the Holy Land. 
the premise is that he's with a group of American travelers, and they're going to these places, and here's what happens. Of course, there's a counterculture where you have someone who is from America who is in a very different place, and the clash of those cultures elicits humor. What you also have in Twain's observations uh, started lending towards satire. As he goes into the Holy Land, his observation is, is that the Holy Land is being materialized, consumerized, and sold. Wherever he goes, there is something to buy. And when he wants to talk about the history of the land, someone offers him something. Uh, would you like to buy this? Uh, so Twain starts making these observations about the land itself. So he's doing satirical commentary uh, on the people uh, in Egypt, uh, and certainly in Europe and the Holy Land. He's also doing it on his fellow travelers, those who have their faces stuck in guidebooks, and he talks about this, as if that is where they're going to get all the information. You can see where Twain was interested. Uh, he wanted to talk to the actual people. So he does parodies uh, of his fellow travelers and Americans who have never been out uh, of the U.S. and the territory. It's a mild satire. Uh, and there's, you know, there's parts where church comes into play, and, and certainly when you're talking about the Holy Land, but it's fairly, fairly mild. This was one of the quotes that, uh, that I appreciated because really we're talking about domestic bigotry here. Eighteen seventy-three. How many of you have read *The Gilded Age*? You should all get a star. Uh, this is this is a book, uh, and hopefully the few audience members who raise their hand will agree with me. Uh, it's simply not a well-known Twain book. Uh, it's the only one where he collaborated with an author, uh, Charles Dudley Warner, uh, and it simply wasn't well known. Even though now I think it's been in uh, one hundred editions. It is a fascinating, fascinating book uh, that is a scathing satire about political corruption and greed. When it all comes down to it, that's what it is. Uh, if you read it today, it would be a very interesting commentary. <laughs> the work took aim at greed, political corruption, in a time of rapid economic growth, industrial expansion, and an enormous influx, influx of immigrants from Europe in this case. For Twain, the wage discrepancy, the accumulation of wealth for the top 2% was shameful. And Twain's satiric approach was really epitomized with the title, The Gilded Age, which suggested that with all of this fantastic wealth that was being generated for the country, it wasn't real. It was a thin veneer of gold over the top. And beneath that surface was the corruption that Twain was trying to expose. I find it interesting that Twain and, and Warner had ori originally planned to issue the, excuse me, issue the novel with illustrations by none other than Thomas Nast, uh, the person who brought down Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall. That would have been quite the addition. Uh, so it's remarkable, I think, for, for two reasons when it comes down to it. Uh, one is that Twain is working with a, a collaborator, and that's obviously rare for him. Uh, the other, and if you want to understand its importance, the Gilded Age is called as such because of Twain's novel. If you Google it, that's what you're going to see, and it will talk about the period uh, after the Civil War, really up to about 1900, perhaps a little bit further than that. Um, but that has become the label uh, for, for the age. Here is a wonderful quote, beautiful credit, the foundation of modern society. Who shall say that this is not the golden age of mutual trust, of unlimited reliance upon human promises, that it is a peculiar condition of society which enables a whole nation to instantly recognize point and meaning in the familiar newspaper anecdote, which puts into the mouth of a distinguished spectator and lands and minds this remark, I wasn't worth a cent two years ago, 
and now I owe two millions of dollars. <laughs> Perhaps this is what Twain was talking about. This is the summer home of Cornelius Vanderbilt, located in Newport, Rhode Island. It was built in 1893. It's a nice little, little home there. Tom Sawyer, as I mentioned, was, was clearly uh, Twain's most autobiographical novel. Uh, I'm, I'm sure almost everyone in here has read Tom Sawyer, which I do think is a children's book. Uh, it was published in 1876, um, and it, there was immediate success with Tom Sawyer. And Twain was also an opportunist. Uh, I find it somewhat ironic when he talked about the Gilded Age because he was always trying to make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> So when Tom Sawyer came out um, and was receiving um, accolades and really great book sales, he began work on another boy's tale of adventure along the Mississippi. And at first he was going to have Tom uh, narrate the book. And by and by he decided that Tom's counterpart, uh, the disreputable, my 12-year-old son is trying to FaceTime me, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have to tell you this. My 12-year-old son's name is Finn. <laughs> and I protested when my wife said, let's, how about Robert Finn Bruce? And I was like, no, everyone will think Mark Twain. Uh, and it was really because we had a great fin friend who was Irish. Uh, anyway, let me turn that off. <laughs> so Twain is hoping to capitalize on his, his recent literary success. Uh, and his original intention was, let's take a boy of 12, um, and this, he's writing this to William Dean Howells, and running through life in the first person. He tried to make it a lighthearted work, but in the aftermath and the failure of Reconstruction, the, the work quickly bogged down. He set it aside and went on to uh, other works and published them. I kept picking the book back up and back up, and finally, um, in 1885, Huckleberry Finn is, is published. Twain did not consider the novel his best work. He was completely unprepared uh, for what happened afterwards. In a caustic review immediately following Huck Finn's publication, Life magazine contemned the book that contained graphic instances of nudity and death. I want to read that again. Life magazine condemned the book that contained graphic instances of nudity and death. There's nothing about slavery in that commentary. There, was also, uh, there were also several reviews that came out uh, that said Twain was treating Jim in a manner uh, that promoted an intellect that, quote, was not there. So you have this sort of this varied reaction among critics, uh, and Twain was simply not prepared for it. The Concord Public Library declared the book had little humor, said it was the various trash. Popular author Louisa May Alcott said that perhaps Twain should stop writing for American boys and girls altogether if this was the work that he could offer. Twain's response was Huckleberry Finn was not for little boys and girls. Twain had figured this out about midway through the novel when Huck and Jim are heading down the Mississippi and they miss the area to go up the, the Ohio. I wish I had a map to show you this. Uh, but they miss their cutoff to go back up the Ohio towards the north. And so they're heading down south. Um, and this is not the, the obviously heading south with a runaway slave uh, is not the way that you want to go. So. Twain realized he had almost written himself into a very uh, large corner. And what he started doing was piling on the satire. If he was going to get this book published, if he was going to get readers to really take a look at what was happening in the country, he had to infuse it with humor. The difference with Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, of course, is the subject of that humor well, it was no laughing matter whatsoever. When you're talking about race, when you're talking about slavery, when you're talking about people. There are close to, and probably over by now, a thousand different editions of Huckleberry Finn. 
It still shows up top 10 on the banned books list. It still elicits all types of critical review and discussion. Uh, it still belongs, in my view, in the college classroom. The high school classroom, we might have to have a little debate about that. Uh, and that's because I think that the high school classroom actually does not have sufficient enough time to discuss social satire. It has to move on to the next. Uh, but um, if you were able to do it in a different context, perhaps it would work. Again, that's, that's just my opinion. The satire in Huckleberry Finn, it involves family, it involves prayer. There are definite uh, stabs at romanticism, that literary genre, genre. Fatherhood, Pap Finn is abusive and tries to kill Huck at one point, for those of you who haven't read the book recently. Church and slavery were the two biggest targets. This is chapter 31. And the context for this is that Huck has been thinking about his teachings in Sunday school and the fact that he is helping a slave run away and that because of that, uh, he is destined for hell. That's what the church has taught him. So he's, he's written uh, a letter. He's ready to send it uh, that will expose where they are. Jim will be recaptured. And this is the quote from that. It was a close place. I held it up, the letter. I was a trembling because I got to decide forever betwixt two things, and I noted. it. Studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, all right, then, I'll go to hell and tore it up. That, my friends, in my opinion, is the single most important sentence in Huckleberry Finn. For Huck, he's throwing it all away uh, and really believes that he is now destined for hell. And as you see, it goes on. Uh, Shove the whole thing out of my head, and I would take up wickedness again, which was in my line being brung to it, and the other weren't. And for starter, I would go to work and steal Jim out of slavery again. And if I could think of anything worse, I would do that too. Because as long as I was in and in for good, I might as well go the whole hog. Uh, there's that little tinge of humor at the end of that. So I mentioned Haley's comment earlier. And... Twain came in with Haley's Comet, and he, he died when it came back. And this was uh, written the year before, uh, coming again next year. You see that I expect to go out with, it'll be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Haley's Comet. So he died on April the 21st, 1910 in Reading, Connecticut, so 74 years old. 2010, the autobiography of Mark Twain is published. It has been under lock and key per Mark Twain's direction for 100 years. Twain left about 5,000 pages of unedited memoirs when he died with those instructions. Uh, now we have three uh, volumes that have been published. The last was in 2015. And some believe that Twain was really trying to generate uh, book sales um, and was causing, really just bringing attention to it and had no intention of it being 100 years. Excuse me, others uh, have postulated that Twain was going to offend far too many people in the autobiography and that it was best left for 100 years after his death. According to the scholar Michael Sheldon, some of the privately held views may have hurt his image 100 years ago. He had doubts, this is Sheldon again, about God and in the autobiography he questions the imperial mission of the U.S. in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. He's critical of Theodore Roosevelt and takes the view that patriotism was the last refuge of the scoundrel. He disliked sending Christian missionaries to Africa and said if they had enough business to be getting on with at home, with lynchings going on in the South, he thought they ought to try and convert the heathens there. It is interesting, I think, that several of Twain's political comments 
found in his writings, in his letters, in his essays, in his autobiography. They're published after his death. Um, and so when you think about political satire and really scathing satire outside of the Gilded Age or Huckleberry Finn, uh, those were not well known. Uh, they came after the fact. For example, a letter to Helen Picard. Yes, you are right. I'm a moralist in disguise. It gets me into heaps of trouble when I go thrashing around in political questions. The political and commercial morals of the United States are not merely food for laughter. They are an entire banquet. This is from the Chronicle of Young Satan. And this is Satan speaking. Will a day come when the race will detect the funniness of these juvenilities and laugh at them, and by laughing at them, destroy them? For your race, our race, and its poverty has unquestionably one really effective weapon, laughter. Power, money, persuasion, supplication, persecution, these can lift at a colossal humbug, push it a little, crowd it a little, weaken it a little, century by century. But only laughter can blow it to rags and atoms at a blast. Against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. And I mentioned Theodore Roosevelt, so I'll give you just a couple of there. This is 1905, a letter to Joseph Twitchell. We are insane, each in our own way, and with insanity goes irresponsibility. Theodore, the man, is sane. In fairness, we ought to keep in mind that Theodore, as statesman and politician, is insane and irresponsible. Mr. Roosevelt is the most formidable disaster that has befallen the country since the Civil War. But the vast mass of the nation loves him, is frantically fond of him, even idolizes him. This is the simple truth. It sounds like a libel upon the intelligence of the human race, but it isn't. There isn't any way to libel the intelligence of the human race. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now that I've used up all, um, really all of our time, um, I, I did want to, if you'll just bear with me, and I'll try and move through this quickly. Uh, talk a little bit about what's happening today in political satire. And I pulled up the Thurber Prize for American humor uh, and just was going through the list. And what I was trying to figure out was where is satire in here? Uh, where is political satire and commentary? And I think, I don't know how many of you have, have read these works. Truth in Advertising, that's a fairly popular one. It is satire on consumerism. You have Lisa Donnelly, who is a finalist. Uh, she is a New Yorker cartoonist and illustrator. And, and that work is on gender roles uh, in social commentary. Bruce McCall and David Letterman. This land was made for you and me, but mostly me. Uh, that is a satire on the ultra-rich, shades of the Gilded Age. 2015, dear committee members, that's a farce on academia, so we don't want to talk too much about that. <laughs> Can't we talk more about something pleasant? That's another uh, New Yorker uh, illustrator, and that's about aging parents. Um, and it goes on for there. 2017, I don't know if you can see this, uh, Trevor Noah. And you probably recognize the name Trevor Noah because he took over The Daily Show. Uh, that is actually about his coming of age uh, in South Africa. Uh, and Trevor uh, Noah is of, of uh, mixed race uh, and how he dealt with that situation. And you can bet it's satirical. The Onion. How many of you have been to the Onion site? OK. Uh, so I, I pulled up the Onion site today because I thought, well, I'll just show it. And it was so offensive that I decided. <laughs> so now you'll have to go home and take a look at it. Um, but. Uh, the, the Onion, I, I had one of our colleagues here, and we simply just weren't able to, uh, to uh, put this together. We were trying to look at trends of how many times people are hitting The Onion. How many times are they accessing the website? And can you tie that to specific political uh, events of the day? Um, the answer was yes, of course, and that we, we were able to do that over the past year. I wasn't able to do it stepping back is what I really wanted to do. So I wanted to take Trump out of the equation, uh, and I simply wasn't able to do that. But you do have the rise of all of these, these sort of news, sti news sites and satire sites. Um, the Borowitz Report, 
uh, is another that is fairly famous from the New Yorker. Uh, Funny or Die is another site that you can go to. Zach Galifianakis has Between Two Ferns where he does this fake interviewing. The one where he just skewers Hillary Clinton I think is worth your time uh, if you can go see it. You also have in TV, I mentioned The Daily Show. Uh, John Stewart was very successful with that, obviously. Uh, full Frontal with Samantha B. She got herself in trouble when she crossed over the line. Uh, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. You have Jimmy Fallon. And then you have Saturday Night Live. All right, let's see if this works. Welcome back from bed. Okay, you get the idea. Uh, and SNL has, I mean, they have a long history of this. Uh, most of you probably remember Chevy Chase, really, it, he, was, he was perfect as Gerald Ford. Uh, and Dana Carvey with George Bush, uh, and, and it goes on. Uh, so Saturday Night Live pulls no punches. They want to know who is in that position, and they're going to go after them. Uh, a lot of people have talked about, and especially Trump has talked about, how uh, he is used too much on Saturday Night Live. The, the president who actually holds the record of being parodied the most <laughs> is Bill Clinton. Um, and I think there are some obvious reasons there uh, <laughs> that we're not going to go into at the moment. Uh, it, it's since I've moved here, we don't, no longer get network TV at, more out of laziness than anything else. Uh, but what I've noticed is access to late night and clips is as abundant as ever. I don't miss anything because it's all being fed through some type of social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, uh, that these are all these clips are still being pointed out, whether I'm up late at night or not. Uh, I do think late night is kind of in a, a uh, heyday, if you will, um, and that's partly because of the humorists who were there are very good. Um, it's also because of how prolific uh, it really, uh, the information is that you're able to access. Uh, how many of you have read The Sellout? Excellent. This is a book you should go out and buy. Um, the, I saw one person back there raise their hand. Um, this won the Man Booker Prize in, in 2015, and I'm going to read a, a, just a quick uh, summary of this. Born in the agrarian ghetto of Dickens on the southern outskirts of Los Angeles and raised by a single father, the narrator of the sellout spent his childhood as the subject in racially charged psychological studies. So this is the, the narrator within the, the book. He is led to believe his father's pioneering work will result in a memoir that will solve his family's financial woes. His father is killed in a police shootout. He realizes there never was a memoir. All that's left is the bill for a drive through funeral. Fueled by this deceit and the general disrepair of his hometown, he sets out to right another wrong. Enlisting the help of the town's most famous resident, Hominy Jenkins, he initiates the most outrageous action conceivable reinstating slavery and segregating the local high school. This lands him in the Supreme Court. The narrator is African American. What follows is a remarkable journey that challenges the sacred tenets of the United States Constitution, urban life, the civil rights movement, and the holy grail of racial equality. It is a powerful book. Uh, the style and I, I would say that the same thing with Huckleberry Finn, those of you who've read the vernacular recently, um, and I tell people, give Huckleberry Finn some time to get used to the cadence and the style of the vernacular. I would say the same is true of, of the sellout and the narrative there. Uh, it is a caustic, caustic satire, um, and one that I, I would recommend in this day and age.
less. This is Andrew Sean Greer, a 2017 novel that won the Pulitzer Prize. I bring this one up, uh, and I confess that I actually have not read this yet. Uh, and I keep getting recommendations. Has anyone read this book? OK, a few folks. Uh, tell me if I'm correct. I keep getting recommendations from folks about a travel book. Um, and if you liked Twain's Innocence Abroad and The Tramp Abroad, and you appreciate that sort of narrative, uh, that this is a step forward in terms of a contemporary approach uh, to, to the travel novel. It certainly is getting great reviews. He's the parody. So at the, you know, at the end of this, <laughs> that really speaks for itself, doesn't it? I, I've come to the conclusion that it's, it's possible that we are in the golden age of satire. Uh, however, uh, I, I actually think we are more likely in a gilded age. Our, our satire is driven largely by the simple fact that it's at our fingertips and everyone can produce it. And the news of today, whatever happened on MSNBC or Fox News or NBC, uh, NBC or NPR or whatever it is, they're already making fun of it in social media. They're already providing satirical commentary. And this will show up then later on tonight uh, in late night. Um, that proliferation, on the one hand, you could argue that that brings us into the golden age of satire. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it does also spread us a little thin, and this, this is personally my, my opinion. Uh, I did an experiment. It's still up here. I went to Facebook just to see what was going to pop up, and there's an advertisement for a shirt, uh, Texas Tribune, O'Rourke gaining momentum. Oh, where is it? Don Lemon to Trump, LeBron James is not dumb. And then down here, uh, a story about Steven Seagal yes. being the envoy to Russia, from Russia. And I thought, surely that's from The Onion, but it's not. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but think what Samuel Langhorne Clemens, what line of work would he be in? if he were here today? Would he be a novelist, a journalist, a writer for The New Yorker, a stand-up comedian, a late-night talk show host, a frequent contributor to news programs, perhaps um, all of the above? And he would certainly have something to say about Congress. This is, uh, of course, Hal Holbrook. And I hope some of you were able to see Hal Holbrook when he was doing this impersonation. And let's see, I think, Curtis, we might have to turn this up just a tad. <laughs> Folks, I really uh, apologize for pre profusely for going over. Um, I am happy to take questions, and, and thank you very much for your attention.